pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Stevens, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, would you like to announce new members and alternates first, or? That would be great. Perfect. Let me go ahead and do that. We want to welcome some new members here today. We have Emily Bear from the town of Erie. Did I pronounce that right? We have uh, Mayor Marissa Harmon from the city of Lone Tree. And we have Ray Bird from the town of Firestone. We have some new alternates as well. So let me, we have Alicia Brown from City of Lone Tree. Is she here? No. Okay. Uh, Mark Browning from the town of Lyons. Not here. Don Cognac, town of Firestone. He's a former member as well. Justin Brooks, town of Erie. Okay, great. Roll call, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just for our new members and alternates, if I call, I will call the member first, and if they don't respond, then I will call the alternate, and then that's when you would respond. Okay, here we go. Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Limbaca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Present. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Stolzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, Sitting County, Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Here. Adam Paul, Denver. Kevin Flynn, Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Here. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahlkemper, Jefferson County. Lisa Ferre, Arvada. Sharon Davis, Arvada. Here. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Allison Coombs, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Brian Schuhard, Boulder. Here. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Roger Hudson, <clears throat> excuse me, Hudson, Castle Pines. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Kim Wright, Inglewood. Emily Bayer, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sarah Dawn Pearlstein, Federal Heights. Ray Bird, Firestone. Here. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Wendy Padilla, Frederick. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Tushare, Glendale. Paul Haveman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Roger Lowe, Lakewood. Here. Isaac Levy, Larkspur. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Marissa Harmon, Lone Tree. Joan Peck, Longmont. <clears throat> Judy Kern, Louisville. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Mark Browning, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Nicole Sterling, Nederland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Justin Martinez, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wee Ridge. Here. Darius Pockbaz, CDOT. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Here. All right, and with that, we do have a quorum, Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented? 
Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That motion goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a public hearing today. I'm uh, Jeff Baker. I am the chair of Dr. Cog. This is my first meeting as chair. So thank you all for your support. I've this is an honor for me. And uh, so um, this evening, Dr. Cog is holding a public hearing on the 2024 title, did I say title six or title VI? I guess it's title six, implementation plan, limited English proficiency plan, Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan, and the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Plan. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents that I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken today related to this public hearing. Receiving public comments is important to the board's decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your hand. Um, if you're online, you can use the Zoom interface. If you've joined by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. All comments received via email through the Dr. Cog website or in writing have been automatically included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to this public hearing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Tonight we have uh, Alvin Bidal Sanchez and Cole Nieder, Dr. Cog's staff, who will now summarize the 2024 non-discrimination program update. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Chair. Come on now, there we go. Every time, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'll be discussing our 2024 update to a series of plans that make up our non-discrimination program. There are three existing plans and one new plan. I am joined by my colleague, Cole Nieder, our senior transit planner. He led the development of the new plan for us as an agency. Um, I will note that this public hearing does cap our 30-day public review period. And as noted, any comments that we have received have been provided to y'all uh, beforehand. So we'll be discussing four plans. Uh, they are a mouthful. I will get through them um, and then use shorthand, most likely verbally, but the Title VI Implementation Plan, the Limited English Proficiency Plan, also known as the LEP Plan, the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan, the ADA Plan, and the 5310 Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program Plan, or the DBE Plan. The three that existed prior to this update are the Title VI, LEP, and ADA Plan. The DBE Plan is new for the agency. Uh, I will cover what each of these includes, what the scope was for the update, and some next steps for us as an agency. I'll start with our most expansive plan. It's our Title VI plan. It demonstrates that we as an agency have the procedures and resources in place to make sure we're providing programs, services, activities in a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, while I do use that term, um, non-discriminatory, and it feels very compliant, uh, we do try to be as accessible, as inclusive as possible, as equitable in our work. So that really is just shorthand for accessible, inclusive, equitable for us as an agency. We do this every three years, and it covers all of our major activities that we've completed over the past three years. So that could be any plan adoptions, plan amendments, um, new plans, and any major programs that we've stood up. How are we making sure all of those are accessible, inclusive, equitable? Then it's one way that we make sure that our recipients and the public are aware of what our process looks like in reviewing our planning process and making sure all those different programs, services, activities are non-discriminatory. Key piece of the Title VI plan is a demographic profile of our region. This is a new update for us. Uh, this does align with our new equity index. So on your screen right now is a two-page spread showing uh, people of color as an example. So for each of the indicators of which there are 10 that make up our equity index, there is a two-page spread available in our plan that defines what that indicator characteristic community is, a county-level breakdown so you can see how that population exists within your own jurisdiction, 
and then a map showing that geographic distribution across our 10 county area. So there is a two page spread for each of our 10 indicators in the index. Um, and those include an addition of people of color, people with low income, people with limited English proficiency, older adults, youth, people with a disability, households without a motor vehicle, people born outside the US, single parent households, and housing cost burden households. The second key piece to our Title VI plan is an investment analysis, looking at our um, transportation investments over the last three years. In this case, we use our most recently adopted transportation improvement program, and then use our most recent equity index data sets to, to compare how different project types are arrayed around the region and how they compare to um, the different areas of marginalization within the region. Like I mentioned, it's our most expansive plan, so it also includes all the different policies and procedures we have in place here at the agency, um, like the statements that we put on our documents that are part of our agendas. We also look at our board and committee structure. What does that membership look like? How does the public uh, have a chance to engage with those committees? Staff divisions here at Dr. Cog, what are our major plans and programs for each of them? What's our actual staff makeup demographically look like here at Dr. Cog? The recipient monitoring, this was new during the last update three years ago, but as we do give 5310 funding out to subrecipients, making sure that they are also in compliance with Title VI. Data, what do we have available to us to make sure we're making equitable decisions? And then public participation, um, some highlights from our public engagement plan. What is our philosophy here at Dr. Cog in terms of engaging the public? Second plan I'll touch on is our limited English proficiency plan or the LEP plan. Uh, the goal is to make sure that all folk in the region can participate to the fullest extent practicable in our various activities. So it outlines how we identify who people who might need language assistance, uh, where they are in the region, what that language assistance could be, and then how we notify them during our planning process. And then also outline staff training that's available to us internally and resources available. Just as the Title VI plan had its own investment analysis, the LEP plan also has a limited English proficiency assessment for the Denver region. Uh, so the two-page spread on your screen right now is showing a geographic distribution of limited English proficient people um, across the region. And then we're also able to provide county level breakdowns in the plan, uh, some flashcards as resources for staff, and then a map of English language learners by school district in the region. Uh, for the development of our LEP plan, we will use a four factor analysis that comes out of USDOT guidance. Uh, so first factor is the number of LEP persons who are likely to be encountered by Dr. Hogg's activities. Number two is the frequency with which that's likely to occur. Number three is the importance of that activity, that program, that service to people's lives. And then factor four takes into account uh, the resources that are available to us, recognizing that we can't translate every document, um, every uh, program service activity into all the languages available currently in the region. So how do we prioritize those decisions here as an agency? third plan is the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan, the ADA plan. It outlines those ADA requirements that apply to Dr. Cog specifically and how, again, we make sure that our planning process is accessible for folk with disabilities. The scope update on this one was the inclusion of all the work that Dr. Cog has done to be in compliance with Colorado's accessibility requirements. So new trainings, new templates, new tools available to staff, just outlining everything we've been doing over the last few years to come into compliance. It also includes information around our office space. While we don't own the building that we're currently in, we do make sure any improvements to areas um, that we lease are compliant with the ADA, uh, making sure our website is accessible, how are public meetings held, when are they held, how can folk get to them in various modes, different ways, um, how does our planning process take into account people with disabilities, how are they involved in the decision-making process, and then just as with the Title VI plan, making sure our subrecipients are also compliant with the ADA in their own activities. And the last plan is our DBE program plan. Um, so this uh, is a new plan for us as a designated recipient of Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding. Um, we have started to hit a threshold that triggers us to have a DBE plan. Uh, and so in the next fiscal year and in the next few fiscal years, we expect to be um, having contracts greater than 250,000 available. And so that um, triggers our uh, DBE plan status. And so this is a new plan for us. It uh, outlines all of the different reporting and monitoring requirements that we have in place, have put in place, 
uh, our goal calculation methodology, and then any uh, resources and forms that we can make available to, to firms during the procurement process. So, like I mentioned, this is a uh, the public hearing that caps our public review period. Uh, we did start this effort off earlier this year in March and April with updating our different data sets and updating that investment analysis that I mentioned. May, we finalized these four documents and our public review period began in mid-June. Um, we are here closing out this public review period right now in mid-July, and then we hope to come before the TAC in August, RTC in September, and back before y'all. Um, in September for ultimately a board adoption of the four plans that make up our program. Uh, we're all aiming for the um, deadline of October 1st. That's when our uh, federal deadline occurs for these four plans to be updated. That concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Um, questions, comments? The hearing is now open to those who have signed up to speak, if any. Oh, I see one. Director, I can't see your name tag. Thank you, Chair. It's Justin Martinez from City of Thornton. I, I had a couple questions. Uh, uh, the first one is about the, the, the map for the demographic profile of the Denver region. On the map, uh, well, on the slide, you, you list marginalized communities and includes people of color, and then there's a list of other. And then on the map, it says distribution of people of color. Uh, does that map include all the populations listed on the slide, or is it really just people of color? The screenshot on the slide is just people of color. For each of those 10 population characteristic indicators, there's a separate page in the plan. Uh, so there's a, an individual map for each of the 10, an individual table for each of the 10, and then a, a definition about how we got to that, that title for each of the 10. Okay, thanks. And I, I do have one other question about another map. Um, the map with the limited English proficiency assessment. Uh, I noticed that there's, um, in, the, in, in the legend, there's four buckets, right? Zero to 1.3, The last one goes 7.9% to 47. Seems like a really large bucket compared to the other one. Is there a reason why that one is so different than the other? Yep, so for each of the plans, um, each of the maps across the plans, we broke out the data into quartiles. Um, so the LEP plan, as well as all the different 10 indicators, just have uh, the, the equal data within each of those four quartiles. So while it may be a larger spread, um, it's showing that there's uh, th that same number of limited English proficient persons within that quartile um, would be the same within the, those other three measurement analysis uh, ranges. Um, for all of them, I will note uh, the geography is tracked level, um, so it does make some analysis difficult. Um, so that is a caveat that we do with these plans. Um, this is intended to be a floor analysis for us in the agency, but when we do more um, specific plans like the RTP, the Transportation Improvement Program, we do try to be a little more specific beyond that geography and provide different types of analysis, but that would just be a caveat. Um, as you review the plans, review those maps, you might see half of an entire county shaded in. And we recognize that uh, can be a limitation, uh, but using the track geography is the one we feel is most reliable for this analysis. Great. Thank you for your clarifications. Director Kondo. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. My question is related to the transportation investment analysis uh, graphic. And I'm just curious, in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, you have the bar graphs. It says project proximity to uh, marginalized communities by project type. I'm just curious, what is the proximity? Is X number of miles? Uh, it's just touching a tract. Uh, so we did, again, do four quartiles, uh, but the project types are based on a, a summary um, roll-up of projects within the Transportation Improvement Program, um, but it is just projects that, uh, census tracts that touch that, that line work or that, that point data set. Yeah. understand. Thank you. I also want to welcome uh, Boulder Board Alternate. It's his first meeting tonight, Ryan Schuhard, and he had a question as well. So welcome, Ryan. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Does the plan contemplate the needs of communities where they host workers and students, but in which the workers and students don't live there? Um, the, I would say not specifically in this plan. Um, it is a 
based on like where folk might be living. Uh, the marginalized communities do take into account different characteristics. Um, so youth is one of those. Uh, as part of the investment analysis, we do tie it to uh, a high level understanding of benefits and burdens that exist with a project by, um, by project type. I'm um, starting to get into conversations around by particular communities. Um, but it is a, a, a geographic analysis based on where folk live in the region. Thank you very much. All righty. I am going to open it up for public comment at this time. Hearing is now open to those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you've not finished your remarks by the end of three minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and very much appreciated. Uh, Melinda, is there anyone who has raised their hand to indicate that they would like to speak? At this time, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Are there any questions from other board directors? This brings to a close tonight's public hearing. Thank you for your testimony, if any, and uh, your interest. Remember, you can always submit comments uh, via email or through our website. Thank you, Chair. Okay, the report of the chair. Um, we have a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee um, which did not meet, uh, so maybe we don't have a report. Which tonight. is the report we did not meet. There you okay. go. <laughs> Got it. Uh, Director Conda, report of the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, tonight we had a very spicy and entertaining meeting. Well, maybe not spicy, but entertaining. I don't mean in a controversial sort of way, but it was very funny. And uh, we authorized our uh, executive director to negotiate contracts of about one and a half million dollars, uh, mostly, well, they're all transportation related. And then I have good news to announce uh, for our area agency on aging, which obviously we were struggling to receive money. Uh, the F&B committee has authorized receipt of uh, grants north of $500 million. So, uh, wait. I'm sorry, did I misread that? 500,000. <laughs> no. You could tell I'm, I'm still suffering from the spiciness. Uh, $500 million. So uh, again, uh, this was uh, something that I think is really notable. And uh, again, thank you for the staff for all the hard work, especially Jayla, uh, always is out there day-to-day -day fighting and uh, getting more funding so we can continue to provide services for our aged. Thank you. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. Report of the executive director. Doug? Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, it's great seeing everybody. A little bit of a layoff. We, I'm, we missed you all. So it's great to see you all again and getting back in the swing of things. Um, I hope your summer is going well. Um, I have a few items I just wanted to touch on for you this evening. First of all, I just wanted to mention that um, in uh, late June, we, we, were, um, we received some guests from the Sacramento area, uh, our sister agency out there called SACOG. Um, periodically, we have requests from, from our, our, uh, our regions around the country to do peer exchanges. And, um, and they were here on June 27th, 28th, and uh, really primarily wanted to have a conversation around housing and transportation. And uh, I don't think they were disappointed. And I can tell you by the, 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 uh, the personal emails that I received related to that, um, it was wonderful. So they had about 20 board members present, as well as other stakeholders, including um, they had a utility that also that came with them, um, uh, folks from their uh, public transportation, um, agency and the like. So it was a good conversation. I, I really want to give a big shout out to Dr. Flo Rotano on her staff who really coordinated the, the, the entire agenda and they were able to see um, a lot of successes of your successes throughout this region. And it's always exciting for us 
to be able to share that with, with folks from around the country. Just want to give you an idea of some of the things that they talk about. So affordable housing, housing in general, was a big topic for them. Um, they had a tour of Capitol Square Apartments. George Thorne, a good friend of Dr. Cog, developer in, in this region, who's concentrating almost primarily on affordable housing now. He, uh, he helped us with that, um, that conversation. They, um, they had a conversation with CTIO at CDOT, at the tolling authority. Um, Sacramento COG, our sister agency, had just become a tolling authority. And you know, it just tell, it shows you how it's just expansive, the types of, of uh, roles and responsibilities COGS take throughout the country. We truly are like fingerprints, right? There's no two alike with, with regards to this. Um, they had a walking tour of Belmar, Lakewood, shout out. Uh, also a walking tour of Loretta Heights. I know that's very personal to uh, Director, Director Flynn. And uh, let me see, they had a discussion of bus rapid transit. Um, they had a bus tour of Colfax BRT line, um, walking tour of steam on the plat and a tour of Sun Valley affordable housing and had a tour of Lowry um, and then had lunch at, at Wings Over the Rockies and, and toured the museum and a walking tour of Central Park before for, uh, uh, departing. So it was a, it was a full, Unpacked event. They invited um, several of us staff, as well as um, our um, executive committee, to attend a reception that they had the, that Thursday night. And uh, it was great to be able to break bread with them too and share and share our stories. So I just wanted to share that with you. And part of the reason I wanted to is because we we at least introduced the conversation with the executive committee tonight about us actually participating in a pair exchange. Um, and we're hopeful the board, that might be something that would interest the board. I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn from our sister agencies, but also it's a great opportunity for us to socialize at a, at a more personal level and get to know each other. So it's something we're going to pursue, and, um, you know, I don't know if we can do it this fiscal year, but we'll make sure we have something in the budget for next year. But we'll do the planning work for in this fiscal year for next. So, so stay tuned on that. Um, speaking of Dr. Flo Rotano, the Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce um, is going to honor Flo, uh, well, will honor the, the positive impact of 25 local leaders at its 2024 gala event this, uh, on August 22nd. And among those 25, our very own Dr. Flo Rotano um, is one of the recipients. Um, <laughs> So those that are familiar with this or those that are not, it's, it's an annual event and it profiles powerful, impactful women in Colorado and, and the work that they do to advance and promote female leadership. Um, winners are selected based on four criteria, civic and community engagement, proven leadership, passion for the promotion of women in business, and uh, perseverance. So Flo, we are so excited for you and uh, we are definitely gonna be in attendance and be the chair and we'll be in the back of the room chairing. So, so thank you for everything you do. We, we, oh, we love you. You know you do. We do. So thank you. Um, Bike to Work Day. Let me just mention that real quick. So we had another successful event this year. We, uh, we had over, let me see, we had over 19,000 riders that participated this year, and that's up from previous years. Coming out of COVID, it's been slow, right? I mean, there was a day when you know, we used to do 29, 30,000 uh, participants on that day, but the, the world has changed, right? There's a lot more folks working from home now and all that kind of good stuff. So we were really pleased with the turnout. Four, 532 companies participated in the business challenge and 256 stations <clears throat> offered uh, sustenance and, re and refreshments in the form of breakfast and bike home stations as well. So I wanna thank everybody that helped us in promoting this event. And particularly, I wanna thank our Way to Go staff at Dr. Cog and Nisha uh, Mokashandam. I don't know if she's here, but a uh, big shout out to her and her coordination. It takes a lot, a lot of work and effort, and it's a, it's a full-time job in itself just getting this off the ground. Um, also, I wanna mention um, a newly refreshed website that we have, you may have noticed, that, uh, that we made some changes to our website. Uh, we soft launched this probably a couple weeks ago now. And um, part of the reason, well, we had always planned on doing an update to our website, but um, it also is in compliance with uh, the new state accessibility law. 
And uh, so we're really excited. We think it's a lot uh, it's it's a lot more intuitive to find stuff on the website. Um, so, like I said, we've soft launched this. We'll do a formal announcement, and press release, and all that social media and everything coming up. So, if there's anything, if you're on that website and, and you see things that you would like to have improved or you see some glitches, please let us know, um, and we're happy to make those 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 changes. I also want to point out that you may have noticed that the agenda was a little different this month too when you clicked on the link. Um, so we have in in it. Um, so when you go to the calendar invite, or sorry, the, the the events page on our website, you'll notice that each each uh, item was listed individually, and that is in compliance with um, the, the accessibility laws. So what we figured, what we found out is that um, it's it's easier. I won't say easy. Easier to remediate each individual item. But then when you consolidate it into a larger PDF, it goes just wonky. And it takes hours upon hours upon hours to actually uh, uh, remediate. So we're still working on trying to figure out what the correct um, path is for all this kind of good stuff. But right now, this is, this is what it is for now. But I will tell you, so in your calendar invite, um, Melinda also included a consolidated PDF as an attachment in the calendar invite. That, that agenda is not accessible but um, um, but it's there just for your convenience. If you do need an accessible version, obviously, you put on the events page. All righty. Um, the last thing I want to mention is um, it wouldn't be a board meeting without me mentioning the award celebration. So I'm going to go ahead and do that again. Um, this is probably, well, next to final reminder associated with. Um, and it's you know just over a month away now. It's on August 28th at Sewell Ballroom. And we'll be honoring projects and plans and people who make our region one of the best places to live in the country. Um, one highlighted the evening is surely to be the announcement of the John B. Christensen Award, um, uh, which is kept a secret until it's announced. This, this award is given to a luminary who represents regionalism. And, uh, and we're really excited about this year's um, uh, selection. And I'll just leave it at that. So if, if you haven't done so already, um, Please register using the link of the uh, flyer that's at your table. Um, for board members, it is it's free for you to come to those to, to this event. It's forty nine dollars for your plus one, which is obviously a discount to um, what the cost associated with is. Um, we're still looking for there's still sponsorship opportunities out there. Um, I would encourage you to um, uh, to purchase a table if you, if you're if you're so inclined and able. Uh, we have 12, I believe, signed up right now, 12 communities that have bought tables. We know there are a couple more in the works, at least. So we're, we're, um, we're uh, you know, real anxious to, uh, to get you there and help, help, help us uh, celebrate the events of that evening. Um, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. That's my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director Rex. I'm now going to open public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated uh, at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have any um, members of the public here present that would like to speak? I'm not seeing any hands raised or anybody standing up. How about online? Uh, there are no hands raised online, Mr. Chair. All right. I'm going to close public comment and we're going to move to the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda, which consists of the summary of May 15th, 2024 meeting and amendments to the fiscal year 2024-2027 transportation, transportation Improvement Program. Uh, Director Starker. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the consent uh, agenda. Director Maurer. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Seeing none, that motion carries.
going to move to our action items, our one action item for the um, the meeting. This is a discussion of the fiscal year 2023 tip um, second year delays. Our presenter is going to be Brad Williams, planner with transportation planning and operations. Mr. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Williams, planner with Dr. Cog. This item pertains to TIP projects with federal fiscal year 23 funding that were delayed for the first time in September 2023 and continue to be delayed as of July 1st. As outlined within the TIP policy, if a second year delay is determined to be caused by the project sponsor itself, then the remaining unreimbursed funding for the delayed phase is to be returned back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. The sponsor may continue their project, but the Dr. Cog allocated funds will not be available. The policy continues to state that it, if it's determined that the delay is the fault of another agency, such as CDOT, RTD, or utilities, or an outside factor, such as changes in law or an increase in inflation, the future course of action and or penalty is to be determined by the board. Their action may, may range anywhere from the loss of funding for the delayed phase or an extension of time to initiate that phase. Starting in January 2023, Dr. Cog has begun tracking the status of these projects through monthly updates with the project sponsors. The long-term goal of this is to reduce the number of delays. While we haven't seen a reduction in delays yet, we do feel that we are much more knowledgeable about these projects. And we believe that the lack of result is primarily due to the four calls of, for projects that we've had over the past two years. Um, this has obviously increased the workload for the local agencies and the regional, regional agencies. Um, and despite all of this, we still haven't seen a increased rate in delayed projects. That said, Dr. Cog's staff has reviewed the status of all project phases that received a first year delay in fiscal year 23 and it's been determined that 14 continue to be delayed as of July 1st. There is a letter from each sponsor of the delayed projects in your packet explaining uh, from their point of view why the project's delayed and a quick rundown uh, from the Dr. Cog perspective. Um, before you, soon before you, is a motion to um, to approve the staff recommendation to continue each project and establish, establish de deadlines for the project phase. And with that, Mr. Chair, I can take questions or comments. Thank you. Any questions for um, our presenter? Um, is there a motion associated with this that page, but a motion that would entertain a motion to approve? It's also on the screen. Great. Director Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the staff recommendation to continue each project and establishing deadlines for each sponsor's project. Director Haseman is seconding. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions. Seeing none, that motion carries. Thank you. All right. We are going to start our informational briefings today. The first one is land use and housing legislation. This is attachment E in your packet. And Sheila Lynch, Director of Regional Planning and Development, is our presenter. Welcome, Ms. Lynch. Thank you, Chair Baker. So as you are all well aware, we had an eventful legislative session again with many bills related to land use and housing. 
So we thought it would be helpful to invite someone from the Department of Local Affairs to join us this evening. Uh, Casey McPherson is here with us, and she's going to dive a little bit deeper into two of those bills. So House Bill 1313, which is the transit-oriented communities, and then Senate Bill 174, which is on housing planning. So Casey will kind of walk through the applicability for our local governments, um, some of the requirements, key dates, and really help us understand kind of what the flow of work will be to get these bills underway. So thank you, Casey, for being with us tonight. All right, thanks, Sheila. Hello, again, Casey McPherson. I'm the senior planner in the Division of Local Government at DOLA in our Community Development Office. And yes, there was a flurry of work. Um, so I'll say I'm part of the people who are leading implementation. It certainly takes a village in this case uh, more than most. We're implementing about five big land use and housing related bills, but for this group, these are the two likely of most interest. And I will be spending most of the time on Senate Bill 174, the housing planning bill, but we'll kick it off um, with the transit oriented communities bill 1313. So here's the applicability of the transit oriented communities bill. It applies to jurisdictions, municipalities that are in MPOs, with a population of 4,000 or more that have 75 acres or more of transit areas, which is defined in the bill, counties as well um, that are also in MPOs and near light rail or commuter rail stations or have unincorporated areas completely surrounded by municipalities, enclaves. So effectively, it ends up applying to high frequency transportation service, um, and you can see the jurisdictions listed there. For those that are not subject to 1313, there is an opt-in um, option called neighborhood centers. So the reason that someone may want to opt in is um, local goals, but also there is an infrastructure grant program associated with this bill. I saw a hand. I had a question, it's Sharon from the city of Arvada. Um, how is this going to be applied when the transit center is in a another municipality. Uh, we have that uh, right now with Wheat Ridge. And so on one side, it's zoned strictly commercial. And on the other side, it's um, zoned differently for Arvada. So we're concerned about that station and then also our, um, oh, uh, I can't remember the name, um, it's on 61st Street. Um, so we're just, concerned that we can't tell we <laughs> see how i said that quietly mayor we can't tell wheat ridge what to do so um and and we also uh that some of our zoning is just problematic thank you yeah thank you good question how do you work with your neighbors um so i'll walk through this and then um hopefully hopefully make that clear so, um, so first off, to lay the framework of exactly, if any of you are wondering, what? <laughs> How does this work? So um, what we're talking about here is that what 1313, the TOC bill sets up, is a housing opportunity goal. So this is a, um, a unit enabling goal. So it's a modification to zoning and potentially um, other criteria as well that impact the amount of units that can be in a certain area. The first thing that's happening is we are creating a map of transit areas. So what the bill lays out is what kind of um, corridors are we talking about here? And then how does each jurisdiction uh, calculate its housing opportunity goal? They do that by looking at this map, which is defined in the bill. It's not just Dole is going rogue and making a map. No, it's defined in the bill exactly um, what must be mapped. And we are um, we're going to be um, holding stakeholder engagement process to check that, make sure the data is right and whatnot. But we must publish this by uh, September 30th of this year. So it's coming up. So we will publish this map and each subject jurisdiction calculates their housing opportunity goal based on how much transit area they have multiplied by 40 units per acre. That'll give a number of units of zoned capacity, not a goal of a number of units to build. Unlike say Prop 123, this is how much capacity must be theoretically possible. Um, yeah. 
step two is uh, jurisdiction will then look at what do we already allow based on our zoning, yes, also our development standards, um, what do we have, and then what's the delta, if any, between those two. By back of the napkin, um, a good chunk of jurisdictions, and that's as specific as I'm going to get, a good chunk of jurisdictions do already meet the housing opportunity goal. So again, calculate the housing opportunity goal, identify the delta, and then jurisdictions themselves identify transit centers needed to meet that goal. So each community will decide where they want the density to go, and that can be different across transit centers as well. They don't have to be uniform. When it comes to working with your neighbors, um, jurisdictions would not be responsible for areas that are not in their jurisdiction. So it would be just looking at the portion of that um, pie, the station, um, that belongs in your jurisdiction is sort of all that would be taken into account there. Okay, and then uh, step four is evaluate existing affordability and displacement mitigation strategies and have an implementation plan. There's a piece of that uh, law that does require jurisdictions to select strategies from a menu. They'll probably look pretty familiar. Some of them have already been popular for a while, um, but we will also, we DOLA will also be publishing um, a summary of what those strategies are because across some of these related yet distinct bills, there are multiple menus of strategies. So we are working to create a combined um, set of strategies so that jurisdictions can comply with many bills at once from one menu. And yes? What happens if um, a transit hub goes away? If it, um, like right after the pandemic or during the pandemic, RTD uh, discontinued some routes that were heavily used. So um, basically they just went away. Yeah, good question. Um, so this 1313 is a law that's point in time. So it's transit service as of the first of this year. Any changes that happen moving forward do not impact um, as well as over the past. So it's about what exists right now, as well as what maybe doesn't quite exist, but is like just about to happen. It's actually in a service plan and is ready to be built, but nothing really beyond, nothing theoretical, nothing like we're hoping to get budget, but it's not there. Um, none, none of those services uh, qualify for being counted in the map. Okay, so, and then for that, so this is point in time, there is some housing opportunity goal reporting that's required by this law. There's a preliminary report due by the middle of next year, and then a final report due by the end of 2026. There's some additional time if any communities need it to do, to take further action. Um, so by the end of 2027 is when it says this law sort of uh, takes full effect. And then there's ongoing every three years stat, much more simple status reports much more simple as if we've created them yet. We have not. That is part of our multi-bill stakeholder process. We'll be working with jurisdictions to figure out the form and manner, meaning um, how can we create reporting processes that are as easy as possible. So that will be completed through our stakeholder engagement process. Moving on to the next bill, if there are no more questions on this one, or the next law, sorry. I'm still in legislative mode. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, just a quick question. Are there any additional uh, requirements besides changes to or updating definitions of zoning district required as, as this process? Good question. It does focus primarily on zoning in the transit centers and ensuring there's enough zoned capacity to meet that housing opportunity goal. But providing that kind of density can also be achieved by um, changing development standards as well, like modifying setbacks, for example. So another obligation in this law is for DOLA to create a methodology for local governments to use as they are analyzing how much density do we allow in that more nuanced way, right? So um, we will be working on that, and that is due, I believe, by February of 2025. Okay, I'm going to move along to the next one because there's a little bit more information, especially since Dr. Cog has been very active in regional housing needs assessment work. Um, there, there are more slides here than the last. So diving right in to Senate Bill 24174, this we've sort of been calling the housing planning bill um, because that's primarily how it's focused. First off, there are housing needs assessments required of all local governments with a population of 1,000 or more unless there's been negative growth. 
uh, or unless they participated in a regional housing needs assessment. After that, there are housing action plans required of local governments who are 5,000 or more in population or 1,000 or more if they participated in a regional HNA or if they're a rural resort um, as of the first of this year. There's a grant program associated with this law as well to help support this work. It also directs DOLA to provide rather extensive technical assistance, lots of materials, trainings, tools, templates, as well as functioning as a clearinghouse to share around all the good ideas um, that jurisdictions already have in place and will develop moving forward. For example, there's a directory contemplated here where we will provide um, examples of affordability strategies, displacement mitigation strategies, and other things. There are also two state reports. DOLA will lead and facilitate engagement for and publish a statewide strategic growth report and a natural and agricultural lands interjurisdictional opportunities report. Uh, there will also be some modifications to state grants criteria. So updating to prioritize projects in or in supporting neighborhood centers. If you remember that from the transit oriented communities bill, it's, that language is also referenced um, law, sorry, <laughs> that language is also referenced in this law as well. So the idea of um, shifting um, the sort of state strategic investments more into these locally identified neighborhood centers, where appropriate, right? Not all grant programs, the ones that would make sense, of course. And um, later, uh, state, certain state agencies are directed to update uh, grant criteria to also consider whether local governments are compliant with doing the HNA's housing action plans and some changes to comprehensive plans, which is the last section here. Uh, Senate Bill 174 also now makes it so that comprehensive plans must include a strategic growth element and a water supply element by the end of 2026. There are some limitations there, but for time's sake, I will move on. Where's the flexibility in this law, primarily in the regional housing needs assessment participation? So, oh, hello, and thank you again, Dr. Cog. And I wanted to focus in on that for the regional HNAs. There are a couple requirements, first on methodology and second on substance. For the methodology requirements, uh, 174 does require a publication, public meeting, local government comment, and there's a submittal process to DOLA for a review. The RHNA must have recommended policy and programmatic responses to the findings of that HNA, as well as an assessment of displacement risk and guidance regarding required subsequent housing action plans and recommendation for sequencing of any future HNAs and housing action plans. That's the process pieces. Uh, here's some stuff on substance. This law um, sort of lays out a, um, a clear and extensive list of what must go into estimating housing needs in the process of conducting a regional HNA. So here's the list, briefly looking at existing and projected shortages or surpluses based on housing types and income levels, looking at existing housing diversity and stock, current jobs by income level, median income, population change projections, job growth projections, demographic trends as, for, as forecasted by the State Demography Office, SDO, um, consideration of population demographics, measures of local resources, to, um, for the development of affordable housing, vacancy rates, measures of homelessness and housing instability, and the jobs housing balance, including availability of housing for low-income workers. Here, here's the timeline <laughs> for you. There's a lot here, um, but the first thing that happens is we are working to publish methodologies for state, regional, and local HNAs and displacement assessment guidance by the end of this calendar year. That's pretty quick. That will include some stakeholder engagement as well. So that's gonna be our, our, our early out product right after um, publishing the maps required by 1313, as well as the parking bill, but that's not on topic for tonight. Um, so, so right after that, by the end of this year, we'll be publishing methodologies. They will look at everything that was listed on the previous slide and beyond, everything that that law says must be in an HNA and in a regional HNA and publish methodologies to, um, for others to follow. Middle of next year, we are obligated to publish the affordability menus, displacement strategy directory, and neighborhood center criteria. Shortly thereafter, we're publishing those state reports I mentioned and changing the grant awards criteria. By the end of 2026, 
we will be receiving local HNAs due to us for acceptance. The following year, we're going to publish a statewide HNA as well as a report on what we've learned from accepting all of it and reviewing all of the local HNAs and regional HNAs. And then housing action plans come shortly after that in early 2028. There's some ongoing status reporting as well as a six year um, recurring HNA and housing action plan process. Those are key dates. Here are the key resources, as I mentioned, directory, the templates, um, and a technical assistance grant program fund. And then just to touch on priorities and next steps, um, we are working on, a, like I said, about five big bills. Um, so here we're just two. So we're doing a multi-bill implementation planning and rollout. We're working on the required mapping and procurement of the time-sensitive deliverables, like the methodologies. That'll be the first out. Um, so we'll launch that. We're providing preliminary compliance guidance. We're part of the way through that. We have a new web page that you can find this and so much more on already. Um, and we'll continue to build that out. And then finally, we are almost done, We're really working hard to finish our multi-bill stakeholder engagement process. So there should be a whole bunch of blasts about that as well. Pat, any questions? Questions? Director Flynn. Thank you. Could you tell us about the 40 units per acre capacity opportunity for housing, how that works in a place like Denver, and I don't know what other cities also have a form-based code where we don't zone for units. We zone for building forms so we could zone an area around a transit center uh, so that it's possible to build 40 units per acre, but the owner and the developer may choose to build commercial or retail or some such instead. So is there a requirement that there be a pathway to those 40 units? Uh, how do we work around that? Yeah, that's a great question. Form-based code came up early, as I recall. In I think we brought it up. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, so that's a great question, and, and I would say that you know, it's really about making it, like I said, theoretically possible. So there's some language in there about like infinity zones, and I can't remember where that number landed. It was like 300 or 500 units is where that one can count. So I would say similar, um, similar to that, and also as we create our methodology for to assist local governments in figuring out exactly um, what can count in our stakeholder process, the, the methodology that's due by February is probably going to shed some light on that. We're going to be spending a lot of time on form-based code, but I would say um, if it were me, I would be focusing on resting easy, knowing that if a developer chooses to build commercial and they're allowed to, or if they choose to build you know, one unit an acre, or I don't know, that would be silly. But um, they can, because it's about um, zoning capacity, not production. Thank you. And our, our, agent, our planning agency has, is pretty much under the notion that we will already meet this. And I think you indicated that there are some communities that already know they will meet it. Uh, the other question I have, <clears throat> does 1313 offer any guidance, any menu or toolkit for uh, displacement, for combating displacement? Because frankly, everywhere that we have upzoned for density, we have displaced communities of color and working families. Yes, it does. Um, there is a there's a displacement mitigation strategy adoption requirement in there and implementation plan. And I think that 1313 and 174 work kind of in concert with that. So we will be developing tools for that, including a displacement risk assessment guide, as well as the menu of strategies, as well as a directory of strategies so that we can promote what is working where and then, you know, make sure that people can steal from what's working. Okay, so not developed yet, but will be developed. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions? Yes. Hi, Ryan Schuhart, City of Boulder. Uh, Dr. Cog has been undertaking a regional housing needs assessment, and I think that has co-evolved along with this legislation. Has any assessment been done to um, show the to speak to each other? I would love to leave that to Dr. Cog's staff to cover, um, but I can say that We've been excited to watch that process, and um, we're looking forward to continuing to talk with Dr. Cog's staff about the outcome. Um, so I should just leave it there, because, right, you'll talk about that next. Director Rex. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about this in the next presentation a little bit, some of the compliance issues associated with our regional, regional housing assessment, and we're still waiting on guidance from the DOLA to see exactly what areas we may need improvement to our regional housing assessment. Um, but it actually, you know, listen, going into the regional housing assessment, we did not know that Senate Bill 174 was going to be a thing, right? But, um, you know, we really were developing that housing assessment to help us inform the legislature about strategies and, and the like, right, about, um, you know, how, how the state could help us uh, further the goal of, of affordable housing in the region. But as it turns out, you know, there's a great opportunity right now as part of Senate Bill 174 to relieve some of the pressure from local governments to have to produce not only the plan, but um, which you have to do, but also, um, you know, right now you have the option of, of using the regional housing assessment as opposed to doing your own local assessment. Um, so, you know, so that hopefully, you know, some, some of the staff resources associated with this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? I believe Ms. McPherson has her contact information on the uh, screen, and um, please send her words of encouragement as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our next informational briefing is Regional Housing Needs Assessment Report. This is attachment F in your packet. And again, for introduction, we have Director Sheila Lynch, Regional Planning and Development. You. So you get to hear from me again, and I am just excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, a little bit of background and introduction. So many of you know that we embarked on a regional housing needs assessment back last fall around October 2023. We got to work very fast on two key areas. The first was to really understand housing need, both current and future need across our region. And then the second piece was to dive a little bit deeper into understanding what are the barriers to addressing that need. And so uh, we hired a consultant team made up of Echo Northwest, Community Planning Collaborative, and MIG to lead us through that. And so we have Tyler Bump here from um, Echo Northwest who's going to walk us through the final report. I wanted to call attention to two things that are in your a memo in your packet. We provided a link to a final report and then a link to the appendices. It may be more information than you want to read on this, but it really summarizes all the great engagement that Tyler's going to present to us tonight. So thank you, and I'll pass it on to Tyler. Thank you, Sheila. Good evening, Chair Baker. Uh, members of the board, my name is Tyler Bump. I'm a partner project director at Echo Northwest. Thanks for having me back to talk to you tonight. Um, this is a celebration a little bit of the completion of this project. We started, as Sheila mentioned, in October. So the timing with the legislative session and Senate Bill 174 we'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, but we were early and then during the session and now figuring out how to align the regional housing needs assessment with the SB 174 requirements. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, a little bit about the agenda today. Um, we're going to give an overview of the final report, um, review the regional housing needs assessment results, uh, talk about what's next. Uh, some of that is the state pieces. Some of it is uh, Dr. Cog's next steps. Um, and then Sheila is going to talk about immediate next steps. So an overview of the final report, our beautiful cover here of our final report that is nine, ten months of working very intensely with stakeholders, uh, you all through the working session and the board retreat, one-off questions from folks throughout the process, the stakeholder advisory committee, focus groups, all of the engagement, all the technical work. It's been a really great project and a lot of work that has gone into this cover page of our report. Uh, the content of that report, we've got an introduction and context, uh, regional housing needs, so what are regional housing needs, how do we think about them, what's the methodology, why is it important to think about housing needs at a regional level. Uh, Submarket housing needs, we've talked about this before, how does the regional submarket 
uh, perform from a housing perspective. Uh, the housing market does not care about jurisdictional boundaries. I know you all do, and that's really great, but the housing market does not. And so how do we think about submarkets at a regional level, and how do you as representatives of your local communities and your governments relate to each other as part of that submarket? Uh, we have a section on systemic barriers to meeting those housing needs. What are the barriers? Um, a lot of those are financial, our lending requirements. A lot of them are policy, regulatory related, process related. Um, some of them are around capacity building, uh, especially as we look at below market rate housing and affordable housing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the last section is really setting the stage for more, moving toward a regional strategy, which we'll talk about as well. So some of the key findings of the report of the needs assessment, um, despite periodic building booms and coming off the heels or in the middle of a, of a pretty intense building boom, uh, the region has not produced enough housing to keep pace with population and job growth. Um, so even though we've seen a lot of development, a lot of housing growth happening, it hasn't been enough. And one of the things we'll talk about in a moment is it hasn't been enough, especially for folks and households at the lower end of the income spectrum across the region. Low-income households below 60% AMI, area median income, represent the greatest need for additional housing across the region. Aging population and smaller household trends will require more diverse housing types uh, than we've been building today or through the last couple of building cycles. Housing types and affordability are unevenly distributed across the region. Um, how folks access the housing market, um, make job decisions, make childcare decisions, how they work uh, community or families work across communities in the region is not even. So some of the results through 2032, um, we have two different sort of forecast periods that we have in our report. We're looking out through 2050. Um, and then we have a forecast period looking out through 2032 to have the uh, near term 10-ish year number that's a little bit more um, really attainable and to think about what are the strategies over a 10-year period as the region starts to think about this coordinated housing needs and housing planning work in the right way um, so that it's a little bit more achievable, less overwhelming. So in that 10-year period, the region's looking at needing about 216,000 new units. About 52,000 of those units are from what we call current need. Um, other times you may have heard this referred to as underproduction, but this is housing that's not available within the region to meet uh, the region's needs today. And a future need is population and job growth um, over the next 10 years through that 2032 period of 164,000 new households for the total of 216,000. One of the things that we've done with this needs assessment is break out that number by income category, and this is one of the requirements of SB 74, knowing that the income distribution needs across uh, the region or communities. Um, over 137,000 of that 216,000 uh, housing units are needed are below 60% AMI, so about 63% of all of the housing that's needed through the next, over the next 10-ish years is below 60% AMI. And so we have been building across the region at a rate that's been pretty, at a pretty quick clip over the last couple building cycle for sure, um, couple building cycles as well, but that hasn't occurred at all income categories. So really thinking about the needs of different housing types and income levels across the region. So what's next? Uh, SB 174, as Casey was talking about earlier, how does Dr. Cog's housing needs assessment align with the requirements set forth by SB 174? Um, as you all as participating agencies in the regional housing needs assessment, this is a really good uh, running start to meeting those housing needs requirements. There's a few specific data points that still need to be figured out of what's in the bill and Dr. Cog's staff are working and tracking to make sure that everything that's in the regional housing needs assessment complies with those requirements. But as Casey presented earlier, there's still a lot of information coming through the end of 2024 um, with clarity on what those requirements are. One of the key issues is what's the planning horizon? Um, as Dr. Cog's staff have explained to me, a lot of the SB 174 requirements sort of set the floor but it's not yet clear about some of the ceiling of some of us have those things. So what is the duration or the timeline for jurisdictions, uh, communities to think about regional or housing needs assessments with SB 174? Uh, data sources used in methodologies. Um, there's lots of different approaches to take here. Analysis of displacement risk, adding in that displacement risk component, uh, and then housing needs for local governments uh, specifically. 
Uh, one other thing that I do want to mention is that housing is important at a regional context, not just because the regional housing market is important, but because there are requirements with uh, transportation, metropolitan transportation planning, to think about housing and transportation investments um, as an MPO. So it's one of the things that Dr. Cog is needing to do with transportation planning rule changes is to think about housing and the alignment with housing. I'm going to share something that's going to be some new information for you all on the next slide. Before I get there, um, I kind of want to talk about the elements or the different categories um, of identifying local housing needs that we've looked at. So these are the sort of four big categories that have helped inform um, how we've done an allocation or a projection of housing needs across the submarkets and across jurisdictions for the entire uh, Dr. Cog region. Um, on the population side, we're looking at current and future uh, population, so that's current population and future population growth. Sustainability, things like current transit access, future transit investments, uh, designation of regional centers as part of the Metro Vision framework, employment, where are their jobs today or where they're forecast to be jobs in the future. And on the housing side, where are their existing affordable units, both regulated and non-regulated affordable units across the region? What is tenure? Are there more communities that have ownership housing versus rental housing? How is that distributed across the region? And vacancy rates. Are we seeing really, really tight housing markets in certain parts of the region versus other parts of the region? And so one of the things that uh, the Dr. Cog team will be making available is this dashboard. And I'm going to walk folks through what this dashboard is. We've helped build this in coordination uh, with the Dr. Cog team. Um, but this will essentially allow uh, local staff and you all to identify what the housing needs are, total housing needs, and housing needs by income category for all of the jurisdictions, including the cities and counties, unincorporated portions of the counties throughout the Dr. Cog region. On the left-hand side of this tool here is a jurisdiction selector. So you'll go into this tool when you have access to this tool and click on it, and you can click on your specific jurisdiction and see how many units are needed in your jurisdiction through 2032 through that 10-year projection. On the primary navigation menu, there's a lot of information on sort of how to use the tool, um, that regional submarket component that I mentioned earlier, local needs, and some of these key trends. And once you click on that, there's a lot of additional sort of information that you can get within each of those categories. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the tool that's going to be available. Sheila's going to mention some rolling out of this with your staff so that folks can use it and start to play with it a little bit and make sure that it is going to be useful um, for staff and the folks that are going to be using this in your, in your communities and your staff on a day-to-day -day basis. So Dr. Cog's path to a regional housing strategy, we have this regional housing needs assessment component at the top of here. Um, what is the data analysis, understanding the barriers and the framework for the strategy. Uh, pretty soon, Dr. Cog will start work on the regional housing strategy. So now we know what the needs are and the barriers. What are the opportunities to think about strategies in ways that reflect um, the unique uh, conditions across communities in the region? Uh, there will be strategies uh, that are specific to the regions. They need to be specific. Not every single community across the region is the same. So making sure that there's different approaches and strategies to meeting those needs um, for the diverse communities across the Denver region. Uh, and then that will also help to inform the regional plan updates to help guide Metro Vision and the regional transportation plan updates in 2025 and 2026. So I wanted to talk a little bit and bring back some of the uh, conversation that we've had around framing a regional housing strategy, which is the last section in the housing needs assessment. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because we had conversations at our April work session with you all on some of these components to talk about what is the purpose of a regional housing strategy on the next slide, um, what are the guiding principles that are important to think about. And again, this is really a helpful way to start that regional housing strategy process by having an idea of where you all want to go and what are the most important things to get out of that strategy informed by the needs assessment that we've just been working on over the last nine months. So on the purpose side, support and further Metro Vision and the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, develop a consistent and data-informed and equity-centered approach to analyzing and responding to housing needs, foster a culture of shared responsibility for addressing housing needs across the region, build consensus around a shared vision and framework for action, increase capacity within local communities to advance housing strategies and respond to evolving needs, and build a region that is more resilient, inclusive, and equitable. One thing that I will note is that this has been a very iterative process, including feedback that we've had from you all, from the Stakeholder Advisory Committee. 
We've had multiple opportunities for folks to, to contribute to uh, modifying and changing this to get to the place it is today. On the guiding principles, a regional housing strategy should align with the region's equity vision for communities that offer access to opportunity and meet the needs of all races, ages, incomes, and abilities, be data informed and grounded in a shared understanding of the region's diverse housing needs. I really think this is an important one to have a regional housing needs assessment with shared methodology and a shared data sources for jurisdictions across the region to know that you're working with the same information from Arvada to Wheat Ridge and that uh, everybody's working with that common set of information. Ensure flexibility in responding to the context of communities across the region. Be comprehensive in addressing the barriers to more housing and more diverse types. Reflect the unique roles and authorities of each sector while facilitating collaboration and shared accountability. Identify resource requirements to ensure actionable plans and deliver desired outcomes and balance near-term results with long-term resilience to meet housing needs under varied economic conditions. And I want to give Elizabeth uh, a shout out, the state demographer on the last one, because she is really good at reminding us that we need to be resilient as a state and a region given changing economic conditions over time. Implementation considerations, um, one of the things that I've sort of thought about of how to present this kind of information, these are examples of the kinds of things that we will have or that the strategy should have for each of the recommendations. And so a strategy will have some clarity on roles and responsibilities. What's Dr. Cog's role for that strategy? Who's the lead actor? Who's actually implementing that in the lead? Sometimes that might be Dr. Cog. Dr. Cog can sometimes play a support role, but who's the lead? Um, and how are supporting and partner sectors identified and what's their goals? Uh, cost and timeline, um, what's the scale of investment required to make the strategy a reality at a regional level? What are the funding sources, either existing or needed to make that a reality? Uh, and what's the time to implement? Uh, does it happen in months or years to help kind of think about how you would prioritize things or phase things over time? And then impact, how many housing units might you create through this strategy or through this action item? Is it focused on affordable housing? Is it focused on workforce housing? Is it focused on market rate housing? How do you think about the housing unit impact of that? What is the segment needed? There's the income that I just mentioned, but also the type. Is it types that are meeting the housing needs and the changing housing needs of a changing region? Is it types that fit within the context of communities, but also respond to changing state regulations and state requirements for, for local jurisdictions? And is it building capacity um, with other organizations and community members to meet uh, needs throughout the region? So the, some of the things that we really like to think about um, in terms of having all of these elements for, for actions as part of a strategy. With that, I'm going to have Sheila come up and talk about immediate next steps, and then we'll answer some questions. All right. Well, we wanted to really ground this in an understanding that um, socializing all of this great information from this regional housing needs assessment takes time. And so before I launch into what we plan to do over the next two months, I wanted to take a moment to just share some gratitude. This has been a tremendous process that has involved many, many, many stakeholders. Oh, I think we reached over 200 stakeholders. And these kind of assessments are really built on the input and great ideas from many. And so I just wanted to name a few groups. First, all of you. We started conversations, I think, two plus years ago with our board to really understand what would it mean for Dr. Cog to step into the space of housing and what value can we really add? Because there's a lot of great work already underway. So thank you to all of you for your great insights and strategic conversations. I also wanted to thank the staff at local governments. We had <coughs> tremendous response from local government staff during this process. Some um, served on our advisory committee. Um, some of them came to focus groups. We even had emails and phone calls of them just engaging with us on trying to understand um, the analysis, trying to understand how they could share the unique perspectives of the unique communities across our region. I also wanted to acknowledge all the stakeholders. Beyond local governments, we reached folks in the infrastructure fields, uh, developers, um, mission-driven housing developers, advocates, people that um, work in the space of environmental advocacy. It was just a broad range of stakeholders, and 
really the what you've seen in this presentation, what you'll read in the report, really comes from all of that tre tremendous input. I also wanted to acknowledge Dr. Cog's staff because truly getting through these kind of processes in a timely and very effective way takes a ton of coordination behind the scenes that you all probably don't see. So I want to acknowledge Andy, Zach, Corey, Dylan, Caitlin, Emily, Nora, and probably more that I'm forgetting to mention, but this was our core group that helped coordinate meetings, review documents. It was a tremendous effort. I also just want to acknowledge our consultants. One of the things that we were struck by is they brought tremendous expertise to this process but they were as incredibly flexible. Uh, Tyler mentioned the iterative process. Uh, the number of times they kind of came back to us and said, we want to make this meaningful for Denver, for this region. How do we do this? It was just tremendous, so very responsive. So immediate next steps. Um, so we understand that this is a lot of information and a lot to dive into in one meeting, so we want to take time to really understand it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to your, to your staff and have a webinar on July 31st to walk through the analysis and to introduce the dashboard that Tyler mentioned in this presentation. We're going to offer up to, to staff and whoever else wants to attend um, office hours. So individually, each jurisdiction can meet with us, walk through the um, individualized questions, and really hopefully leave those office hours with a better understanding of, of the um, assessment. And we are going to be presenting at the quarterly city and county managers. So we want the administrative leadership at your cities um, and counties to really understand the work that's been done and, and the findings that we've come up with. And then sometime in the fall, I don't want to name a month yet because <laughs> this is a lot to get through and it may take us more, than, more time than we think, but we are going to take the time and then come back to you all with our final report, um, hopefully for acceptance. One other thing I wanted to mention, it's not necessarily on the slide, but Tyler mentioned it. We are behind the scenes figuring out our next step, which the board has, has agreed to of moving forward with that regional housing strategy. So staff have been working very deeply trying to understand in this new context with new laws in place of what we should be including in that housing strategy. So probably in the next, in the coming weeks, we will be releasing an RFP so we can get um, consultant support on board to help us with that process. Those are the immediate next steps. And I guess we'll pause here with any questions. Thank you. Uh, first question for Mr. Tyler. I'm, I'm just curious on on slide four, you talk about systemic barriers to meeting housing needs. I wonder if water uh, availability or ability to process sewage water is, was a factor considered. We had many conversations on utilities broadly across the region. Um, and we've had lots of conversations, as Sheila mentioned, as part of our stakeholder group with utility providers around some of those barriers too. So yeah, it is um, water, um, electrical, there's pretty much any utility that you can imagine is um, has come up as, as, as a barrier in different communities, not in all communities, but in different parts of the region. You know, I was just thinking, you know, Northland, we're uh, kind of blocked in, and I think our ability to process sewage water is about 85%, and if we continue to add more housing units, that's going to force us through, I, I believe, EPA requirements to consider building or expanding our sewage system, which will be very expensive and an unfunded man. So, you know, that, that is a concern that is, you know, top of mind for me. And then one other question for Sheila, you know, great work, first of all. Um, but I'm thinking to myself, it's important to close the loop, right, with state and, and the governor's office. So I'm wondering if that's also part of your next steps. Great question. Um, so we've had several conversations already, at least with the Department of Local Affairs, to try to understand the timing of the rollout of some of the new laws, to understand where there's synergy and where we can actually um, you know, really continue to do the work. One of the things I think we shared with DOLA was part of what's already underway at Dr. Cog is really the spirit of what some of these laws are trying to achieve. So how do we work together to ensure that the momentum continues and we don't get caught up in some of the specific requirements of each different uh, bill, but really continue to move forward. With that said, we haven't circled back 
specifically and had conversations with the governor's office, but I know we an anticipate come the fall to have deeper conversations with them. Other questions? Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I also would like to echo the gratitude um, that, that Sheila had mentioned with stakeholders, you all, your staff, many stakeholders throughout the region. Our, our consultant work has been tremendous. It's a big lift over a short period of time, so it's been wonderful. I will tell you that um, as it relates to the local housing data dashboard, um, you know, we're deliberately uh, we're be, I should say we're being very deliberate about how we roll that out. Um, we want to make sure that we have conversations with your staff, that they understand the methodology that was used in developing those dashboards. And also we want to make sure everybody understands what this is and what it is not. It is um, it's based on need, based on you know primarily um, existing in future economic conditions within your community has created a need for housing, right? It is not a target or an allocation to that community, but it is what is being, what is, um, what is net, the housing that is necessary, the units that are necessary um, in order for us to move forward, right? So we believe that conversation about targets and allocations is better handled on a collaborative basis amongst you and your neighbors about how ultimately that housing is going to be established within our communities. And that we're part of that, we're working and the regional housing strategy work is hoping that we can set up a, a, a foundation or a platform for you all to have those conversations. It might in part be um, associated with the sub-regional forums that we utilize right now for, for transportation and other, other conversations. So just stay tuned on that. That's why we're taking several months to have conversations with you and, and your staff associated with this so um, everybody feels comfortable as we move forward into the next phase. So stay tuned. Oh, I should also mention, I think this is fair to say that um, you know, so the report and everything, you have that, that's in your packet. So if you have any specific comments or, or, uh, or questions about the content, please let us know, let Sheila know, and, um, and we'll be sure to, uh, to make the appropriate revisions. Director Stryker, uh, Stryker first, then Director Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, uh, the download on the report. Very interesting. In the report, we talk about housing units. Um, but at the end of the day, it's people that need to occupy those units and go to sleep in them. What's the relationship between population and, and housing unit? That's a really good question. Uh, complex is the answer, the short answer. Uh, the long answer is that we've looked at population, population trends, population forecasts, how households, which are the people inside of those units, um, relate to that housing unit and how that housing unit um, maybe looks different in 10 years than it does today of what's needed as part of the population. Um, the region is aging. Uh, the age profile and the population profiles are shifting um, in different ways, both at a regional level and at a sub-regional level, and that's accounted for in the way that we've done the needs assessment, too. So it's, it's very well integrated on population trends and how households and individuals within those households relate to housing units and housing need. Thank you. Director Flynn. Thank you. I see the draft report is available on, in the material we got. Is the dashboard live? It is not. Right? When, yeah. When will that be? Do you know? Well, I think that's part of the conversation we want to have with your staff and that first Director Flynn, to make sure that they feel comfortable with the methodology that was used for this dashboard before, you know, we make uh, because because there is I mean because it is you know because it's it's draft really you know we want to make sure that some of the assumptions because some of you folks so some of you your the communities have done their own local assessments too right so we want to try to have that conversation with with the communities to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Lynch and Tyler. We appreciate it. Words of encouragement for them too. Next up on our agenda is a update on the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. This is attachment G. And again, we're joined by Cole Nieder, Planner, Transportation Planning and Operations. Cole?
Thank you, Chair Baker, members of the board. My name is Cole Nieder. I'm Dr. Cog's senior transit planner and a staff representative on the Northwest Peak Rail Study uh, Project. Uh, today, RTD, uh, we are lucky enough to have RTD here providing us an update on that study and then also providing a primer on the remaining activities um, for this project going forward. And so this pr presentation, it's going to include uh, finalizing the peak service study and the next steps regarding that, uh, details on identified infrastructure requirements, uh, accessibility compliance and an overview on community and stakeholder engagement. And I'm going to pass over the project presentation to uh, Patrick Stanley, the engineering programs manager for RTD's capital programs. Thank you, Cole. Uh, Chair and members of the board, thank you very much for uh, having me here tonight. All right. So again, my name is Patrick Stanley. I am the uh, manager of engineering programs at RTD and I also serve as the project manager for the Northwest Rail uh, feasib uh, Peak Service Feasibility Study, which is really uh, looking at um, our commitment from 2004 um, and looking at a peak service concept, uh, which I'll kind of just a real quick overview of this before we jump into this a little bit for those that maybe need a refresher. Uh, 2004 uh, Fast Tracks uh, passed a, uh, the ballot measure included a, uh, a rail up to uh, Longmont, um, and this is a continued effort uh, to try to figure out a solution to get some rail up in the area. Peak service is concept is three trains. Uh, we, it was a weekday service, three trains in the morning from Longmont to Denver, and then three trains in the evening back from Denver to Longmont. Um, it includes six new stations. The, on the map that you see up on the screen, there's a solid green line uh, down in the bottom on the map. That is the B line, uh, which is an electrified overhead cannery powered system that opened as part of the Eagle project in 2016. And then the remaining dashed portion of the corridor runs along the BNSF right away between the existing Westminster station and Longmont. So tonight we'll give you a quick uh, project, project status overview. Uh, I want to go over some of the details of the required infrastructure that we've discovered uh, to date on the study, go through the common set of facts, uh, what that information is going to contain, look at briefly go over some opportunities, especially with some of the partnership opportunities that might be uh, that are definitely being tossed around in the in the state right now uh, in particular, and then uh, go over some of the community and stakeholder engagement efforts that we've uh, recently done. So real quick on the project status, uh, HDR, who is our, our uh, uh, consulting firm, is working uh, really kind of completing milestone three um, in there. It's a five milestone process. Milestone three is the, what we call the base configuration. So essentially that is what is, what is the infrastructure, what are the operational costs, the maintenance costs, um, the capital costs, et cetera, uh, for what it would take to actually run those three trips in the morning, those three trips in the evening, on the BNSF right away and the RTD right away. Um, they're also working on milestone four. Uh, milestone four is looking really more at um, service options. Um, and you know we've heard a lot from the public about maybe peak service doesn't necessarily meet everybody's needs. So what might some of those those future options be? Um, they're also working uh, really getting close to finishing up. Uh, like I said milestone five, four and five, which is the implementation plan. Uh, the BNSF Railway, uh, we have contracted the BNSF to do a 30% basic engineering plan for us. Uh, this is something that we haven't had the pleasure uh, or the, uh, you know, of having recently, uh, the luxury of having in some of our, some of our recent, uh, recent estimates, actually uh, plans from BNSF and cost estimates from BNSF. So some of our recent cost estimates were an assumption um, and some estimating kind of without that benefit of their input. Um, so right now we have received the 30% engineering plans from BNSF. We've also uh, received from them the 30% engineering costs um, for the, the design and the construction of the infrastructure needed. That is in review right now and our HDR team is looking to incorporate that into our, into our final study. There are two big pieces of information that we are still waiting on the BNSF um, that is the easement, um, which is a one-time real property deal, uh, capital uh, cost that, that RTD would have to pay to basically get the time on the track. 
And then the other piece that we're also still uh, working with the BNSF on is, is the operational cost. Uh, so I wanted to touch a little bit on Front Range Pass and Rail District. I know, um, obviously, I'm sure everybody in this room is pretty familiar with uh, what they're trying to do as well. Um, HNTB, who's their consultant right now, is working on their service development plan, trying to understand what their service might look like and what they want to um, put out there as their delivery plan. So I would like to mention that Front Range Passenger Rail and CDOT both sit on our study advisory team for our projects. So we've invited them in to know what we are doing, and we have had continued conversations this whole time with them um, about where some, some opportunities might be to, uh, for a potential partnership. Um, I think that's about it. So I mentioned uh, the six new stations, uh, you know, just to, it won't necessarily go over station by station, but these stations will essentially com, uh, conform to RTD standard uh, station uh, uh, configurations. Some of them will have parking, some of them don't, kind of depends a little bit upon the jurisdiction um, and the need at those, at those locations. Um, it would be pretty standard from what you'd see on our commuter rail system that we have uh, on the A line, the B line, and the G line. Um, we are looking at a level boarding scenario that is different than all the previous studies that we've done on the Northwest Rail. And the reason why that is, is we want to make sure that we are at the highest level of ADA or accessibility compliance that we can be. We also want to be equitable. Uh, you know, all the other commuter rail systems that we've opened have level boarding. You can just go right onto the train. And uh, we also have existing stations as part of the B line that was opened in 2016 that are also already high level platforms. Um, there are three freight sightings, uh, passing sightings we call them. And the way our concept is working that we're looking at for peak service is that we want to secure time windows with the BNSF. So the idea is that those three trips that are coming in in the morning, the BNSF would actually vacate the track for us so that we would have operational priority during that time window. And the same thing in the evening. So as one of the requirements that BNSF has told us in order to do that is that they need to be able to pull their trains off of the mainline track so that we can have that priority running. Um, and as a result, we ended up with three of these what we call passing sidings where they'll stage and we go past them. Um, and they total about seven miles um, of total uh, passing, uh, passing track. Um, and then we've, we've located those and worked with the BNSF to make sure that we limit the amount of impact so that a BNSF train is not sitting across a road crossing or something like that. Um, and then, of course, we've got um, quite a bit of uh, track improvements for speed and reliability. Uh, we, we would run up to 79 miles an hour. Uh, that's our standard for commuter rail. Um, and their track is not necessarily designed for those speeds. Um, and in order for, to meet our time desires for total travel um, and hit our speeds, there are things like curve smoothing, uh, track profile changes, that sort of thing that need to, need to be done to allow our trains to run on that as we like. Continued infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of drainage upgrades, um, you know, especially where we have those siding tracks. You can imagine we have to extend culverts and drainage lines. Um, there are a lot of what I would call substandard drainage um, uh, locations along the corridor uh, that need to be upgraded. Uh, right now there's 41 at-grade crossings that we would go through uh, on the corridor. Many of those have already been established by the local jurisdictions as quiet zones and great job because I know that's, that's very difficult to get those through. Um, uh, many more are still planned, um, but we would have to do some safety improvements at some of the crossings if we impact them. Um, like if we have a, a section of double track that goes through when right now it's a single track, we'd have to modify medians, gate locations, make sure that we're channelizing pedestrian pathways um, and making those safe, safe crossings for the community. Uh, we'll have a rail maintenance facility up in Longmont. Uh, this is a different, this will be a different train technology than what we have on our current, uh, our current system. And that's mostly because we can't do the overhead powered uh, system, the OCS, um, because we don't have clearance uh, under some of the structures um, as, we, as we run along the BNSF corridor. So we will have a different train technology um, and that results in a different maintenance facility. <laughs> Um, midday layover, uh, you know, obviously we're coming three trains in in the morning. 
we got to put them somewhere before we come back in the in the evening. Um, so we looked at various options, and right now we've we've really uh, landed on uh, actually staging those trains north, just a little bit north of the existing Westminster station on the B line, um, right before Lowell. So just a little bit more information on the high level boarding. I went through some of it a while ago, but again, it's an it's an equitable and operationally efficient as well. We you know depending on how trains work out in the future and future fleets and inter, inter, even interoperability, it's efficient to make sure that our trains can actually use the same level platforms. Um, there's some logic to that. Um, requirements, you know, again, we're looking at, we want level boarding. We want this to be equitable, accessible. Um, and uh, we want to have equal service for all of the stations along the corridor. So again, we have Union Station, 41st and Fox, Pecos and Westminster that are existing today at a high level. And we didn't want to have the communities up north have to deal with something that's not quite as uh, easy to, easy um, and accommodating. There are, there are a low level platform when we looked at whether or not we should do high level and low level. There are a couple low level platforms at the US. But right now, if we were to try to utilize those, utilize those we think that would interfere with Amtrak and potentially with front range passenger rail. We don't know exactly what they're operations are going to be just yet. Um, and then uh, really we think that the uh, the Northwest Rail, the ideal solution would be that it actually operates off of the same platform at DUS that the B-Line currently does today, which is which is actually track eight. Hopefully I'm not yelling at you. I've done a few of these and I still don't know how close to get to the microphone. So, um, so obviously high level platforms um, you know, really kind of leads to a high level train. There are different options, but um, one thing to note obviously is if you have a low level floor train and we try to serve one of the existing platforms, doors could open and you're just gonna walk right into the edge of the platform and, and it just physically doesn't work. Um, really the mini high blocks, if you were trying to do ramps kind of like we do on our light rail right now, that's strongly discouraged and not really accepted by the FTA anymore. If there's unless it's operationally infeasible and cost is not a consideration for us to determine operationally infeasible. Um, there are some, dis we did look at multiple level cars to see if that might be a solution. There are a lot of disadvantages with that. Um, mostly that you, that's when you end up getting into lifts or bridge plates. Um, those end up being higher installation costs, more maintenance costs, more potential to fail and, and you know result in people getting trapped on the trains or not getting at the location that they originally intended to be at. Um, it's inferior in our opinion and, and, and provides on the unequal access. Um, it adds to the dwell time. You can imagine, you know, right now our dwell time is probably 30 seconds at a station. We stop, sit there for 30 seconds, let the passengers get on and off, move on. If we have to deploy a lift or a bridge plate or something like that, now all of a sudden you're, you're talking minutes instead of seconds. And when that adds up over the entire corridor, you really start to add to your travel times. Our travel times uh, affects ridership. Um, on to the next. So when we started the, the study, we really had several key considerations we wanted to look at. One is the initial level of service, and that's really the peak concept that I talked about earlier. Uh, you know, what are the operational requirements that we need to think about? Um, what is the required infrastructure? That was a big one. What do we have to build in order to do this that's not out there today? Um, and what is the cost to build that? And what does it cost to operate the initial level of service that we've identified? Uh, what is the travel time, uh, the projected ridership, and the benefits and impacts of a peak service? I would like to mention a little bit, even though we've had a lot of conversations with Front Range Passenger Rail, and there's been a lot of conversations about how we might team up, especially with Senate Bill 184. Um, peak service really is focused more on RTD. Um, what we're trying to look at is how we don't preclude any potential partnerships and any kind of joint operational configuration with a front range passenger rail. Uh, so the common set of facts, um, these are kind of the, the pieces that will come out as a result of the study. Uh, we're going to look at the, the station's accessibility compliance, as we talked about uh, a second ago. One thing I, I didn't mention a second ago, and I apologize, is that in order to get the high-level platform, we actually have to have a siding track 
at those platforms. And the reason for that is the BNSF requirement for freight trains is eight foot six from the center line of the track to any obstacle, a structural obstacle. Our trains are narrower and we need we need five foot four in order to get the gap so that we can board the train um, at the platform edge. So you can imagine if we if we try to do our platforms at five foot four in a center line of track, we're gonna run into a problem when a freight train comes through. So in order to do that, we have to separate the track um, from the main line at the stations. And um, so that's, that's part of the accessibility as well. Um, so the track improvements, as we've mentioned earlier, and the acquisition of the easement from BNSF that are talked about, and that's, that's really a percentage of the corridor um, from an from a area standpoint in association with the amount of time that we would be using the track um, compared to what the BNSF does. So if, we're, if we say have three hours in the morning for our peak, our peak period window and we have three hours in the evening that we secure, that's six hours basically of track time value um, that we would end up, that would be part of the agreement, one of the ways it's calculated. Uh, operating costs, uh, you know, what's it gonna cost to maintain the fleet? Uh, right now, we are we are uh, assuming that we are going to maintain the fleet, um, and we would maintain the stations. The train operations themselves, RTD, for purposes of this study, uh, would like to operate the service ourselves. It could be operated by BNSF under contract. It could also be operated by another third-party operator as well, as long as they meet the BNSF safety requirements. Uh, dispatching will be by the BNSF for the portion that BNSF controls. One of the things that's unique about our this particular line is that we actually have a portion that's already built that is operated by Denver Transit operators, our concessionaire from the Eagle Project. So they have their own dispatching for their segment, and BNSF has their dispatching for their segment. There's a handoff at the Westminster Station. Um, and that's the same with the uh, positive train control as well. Um, track maintenance would be by the BNSF. Uh, we would have to we would have to compensate them for track maintenance. <clears throat> then of course ridership projections as well. Uh, we looked at the impacts and benefits, environmental impacts, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, we're not doing a NEPA NEPA. We're not doing a NEPA process right now. This is really linkage. Uh, information, we're gonna take this information and be able to carry that forward if this project were to move into the next stage. Um, and we're really focusing primarily on the things that we think are the, the the most likely to have an impact. And that's, you know, that's gonna be air quality, noise, visual uh, impacts, a vibration, those sort of things. Uh, we have done some environmental justice and we are working on some preliminary Title VI analysis for the service change for the whole corridor as well as for the siting of the maintenance facility. But I want to just reiterate, we can't finalize a Title VI until we're actually ready to go, so it is preliminary at this stage. Uh, looking at land use impacts, transit and development opportunities, uh, avoiding, and I mentioned earlier, avoiding impact actions that preclude the Front Range passenger rail. You know, if we, we've got a lot of discussions with them, and we want to make sure that we can accommodate a, either a joint or an overlay type service. Um, and then our public stakeholder identification of issues. We have a really good study advisory team, our SAT, which has kept us on our toes and, and uh, brought a lot of issues to our attention. Uh, and then service characteristics, travel time. Um, we have, for the group here, um, identified that a 65 minute travel time from DUS to Longmont is achievable. Um, and that's what we've given to the BNSF for their modeling when they did their 30% their design. So we told them this is the time that we want to hit, and they can do their engineering judgments to make sure that the curves and all the track geometry can accommodate that. Um, and then required infrastructure, stations and parking and, and access. So I want to touch a little bit on the, the opportunities that we see with Northwest uh, for Northwest Rail Peak Service and potential partnership maybe with Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, they are separate projects right now, um, and that's uh, it's interesting to try to kind of put those pieces together. We're not we're not doing this jointly at the moment, um, but again, the conversations have happened, and, and there's a lot of these economy of scales that we think are possible, and we just want to hit on a few of those items. 
you know, joint operations efficiency, as you can imagine if we have, you know, we could share operators and equipment and some other things like that. Potential synergies arising from a common fleet. Um, if we buy, if we purchase the same vehicles that they do, as an example, uh, we might even be able to drop, you know, a train set or so. Um, we could um, go in together and be more uh, competitive in a purchase uh, with, with a uh, company. Possible to share reduced operations and maintenance costs. Um, that would be, you know, splitting some of the costs that we pay to BNSF to maintain the track. Um, possibly sharing a maintenance facility, that sort of thing. Uh, potential to share in track improvement costs. Um, you know, all the improvements that we have to do on the track, it benefits both parties. So there's a, there's a, a good cost sharing opportunity there. And then potential to share in cost of safety systems and crossing upgrades. So one of the big ones right there was a positive train control. Um, for those that don't know what that is, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you heard it when we were testing the A-line and the G-line, but um, <laughs> it's basically an overlay signal system that that really prevents uh, major accidents from happening. It, it, it kind of controls, and it, and it, I'm going to really, really dumb this down um, partially for me. But um, so essentially, as an example, if a curve has a has a certain speed to go through a curve, and you're going way too fast in that curve, the system will throttle you down a little bit so that you cannot go through that curve at an excess speed into rail. <clears throat> that is a requirement for passenger rail. I uh, want to touch real quick on the community and stakeholder engagement. Um, we had two quarter-wide open house events. One was in uh, January and February of 2023, and then our late recent one was in November of 2023. Um, the, we've also had a series of local pop-up events. We had 14 community pop-up events at community uh, events. Had about 885 or so visitors come through there. Uh, great conversations. It was, it, was, it was great to hear from people. Uh, we have a monthly study advisory team. Uh, again, that, that team's been super helpful for us. One-on-one uh, -on -one concept conceptual uh, or conceptual design meetings with the local jurisdictions, primarily for stations. Um, and we've done some uh, board committee updates in April 2023, October 2023, and more recently we did a uh, presentation to the full board in March of this year. I wanted to touch real quick on, on what we heard in the most recent uh, open house, and I would say that a lot of the results that we heard in the November open house were very similar to the, same, to the themes that we heard in the January open houses. Um, so in November we had uh, it was in Longmont and Broomfield we had a total of about 130 uh, in in those two events in person. Um, we also had 70 in the same time frame we had 785 email signups um, uh, on our system, but we also set up a self-guided online meeting which had the exact same content as what the public open houses had, and we had about 6,000 views of that self-guided online meeting. About 2,600 of those or so were actually engaged sessions, meaning somebody actually got in there and clicked and, you know, read more and, and, and you know, looked at videos and that sort of thing. Um, and then we had a total of a little under 400 total surveys from, from that event. So just real quick, I uh, wanted to go, I want to spend a huge amount of time on these, but um, uh, we asked the public quite a few questions about peak service in general and what might make it better. Um, so we'll go through some of these questions. This is one of them that we asked is, what do you see as the benefits of the peak service, uh, peak rail service plan? And they got to pick three, each, each person did. Um, and then really the biggest one is reduce my carbon footprint, embrace a more environmental uh, friendly lifestyle. Uh, and that, that was the biggest one, getting to my destination without worrying about weather and traffic, um, crashes, delays, et cetera, kind of a reliability uh, item. Uh, came next, and then really next, the next biggest one there was the added time on a train gives me time to work. So it's really more of a relaxing commute item came up a little higher than I might have expected, but, but I do take the train every day, and I, I understand that. <clears throat> uh, we asked, you know, what do you believe is your greatest barrier to accessing, uh, accessing the station uh, and, you know, missing sidewalks and bike lanes? <clears throat> Excuse me, number one. Uh, missing and frequent bus service uh, came in after that, and then you know next two are really unsafe walking or biking conditions and lack of secure parking. So I think what's interesting in this it really kind of shows that first and last mile connectivity is is a big issue um, <clears throat> for the for the uh, community. How can peak service be enhanced to better meet your needs and expectations? 
Um, this is very common, very similar to what we heard in January. Uh, reverse commute. Uh, actually, weekend service was first, um, so it's beyond weekday service. And then uh, reverse commute was really the next big one up there. Um, <clears throat> next was improved first and last mile uh, connections and then uh, add service at major events. So a lot of the comments that we actually got back were really kind of fundamental to the limitations, I would say, of the peak service um, that were, that's being proposed. What concerns you most about peak, uh, about peak rail service? Um, really, again, kind of same sort of theme. You know, what we know that peak service is somewhat limited on what it's providing, so these kind of go into those categories. Service only serves one direction uh, in the morning and the evening. Uh, the limited hours of operation and the lack of weekend or evening service. What is the most important element to include at or adjacent to future stations? We thought this was an interesting question, not only just for RTD, but also for our stakeholder communities as well. And uh, really the first one, it kind of goes to the live, work, play, uh, commercial and retail spaces, the shop, eat, uh, grab coffee, et cetera. And then next was, was housing. Some common themes, I think, here. So next steps, uh, you know, we're still working to identify the required infrastructure. Uh, and we really have that pretty much nailed down now that we have the BNSF 30% plans. Um, so we're really kind of taking those co that cost information, incorporating into the final report, uh, cross-checking everything right now. Um, this is a little bit outdated since we sent this over, but the BNSF, we've received the 30% design um, and those cost estimates. Um, and again, we're working to incorporate those, uh, those elements right now. Continue to co complete the common set of facts. And really the biggest pieces that were, are outstanding for us right now are those missing BNSF pieces, the operation, operating costs and the easement cost. Um, we've got a pretty good handle on the RTD cost for stations, uh, maintenance, storage facilities fleet acquisition, and uh, kind of the general operation and maintenance costs that would be under RTD's control, um, and uh, continue to work on the ridership as well. So I uh, wanted to touch a little bit on uh, Senate Bill 184. Um, obviously, for those that I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with it, but I'm guessing most are, um, that really um, looks at uh, implementing a framework for partnership between RTD CTIO, which is the uh, um, uh, Colorado Transportation Investment Office. Did I get that right? I think so. Um, and uh, CDOT. So it's really, I think, accelerating some of those conversations that we've, we've already had a bit. Um, so far, just an update on that, we've, I know our, at a project level, we've met with a facilitator that the state has hired, um, and we've been able to sit down with them and identify what's important to RTD um, as far as what our plans are. And we know that that has also happened at a morning executive level and with CTIO and with CDOT. So kind of the next steps, I think, are to kind of bring all that information together um, so that we can have a, a broader discussion and try to, try to figure out how to meet everybody's goals. Um, community and stakeholder engagement uh, will continue to uh, have community touch points and engagement along the way. We don't want this to be a study that we're gonna put up on a shelf and forget about. So there are gonna be continued uh, conversations, we believe, with the community as we move forward. Um, and one real quick thing, just to, to note, we do have a couple challenges still with a, with a few stations. Um, it's nothing that we can't work through, but it's kind of some late information we got from the BNSF on how they plan to do a potential expansion if they do something with their freight, their lines add a second main line. Uh, where that main line wants to be and how that might impact uh, the community plans and RTD operations. So continue that conversation to make sure that everybody everybody has a, uh, a good path forward. And with that, I'll turn it over for any questions. All right, questions, uh, Director Peck. Does it come on? Oh, it comes on automatically. Thank you very much for this update. Um, I am on the FRPR board, director's board, so I do have some questions uh, and hopefully some suggestions that you can take back. Um, my first question is, 
uh, per 184, when the governor has mentioned that he would like this done in three and five years, and I know that is a very close agenda that he would like to fulfill, are you still saying at RTD that uh, the peak service will not be finished or even started until 2050? You know, that, that's part of, I think, what this study is for, is to understand the costs, and then we can look at it and see what we can do and what we can't do. That, that's a board discussion, a board decision on, on the feasibility of that and, and how we want to move forward on that. This study is trying to, uh, trying to assemble the facts that can be used to make a decision on, on how to do that. So right now, that is the situation, um, but depending on what the facts find, it could change. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing is that uh, 184 also suggested uh, strongly that the three entities, along with CTIO, form a transit authority or a three-way IGA. Have you um, decided if you're going to do that and when? And the reason I'm interested in that is that several of the things that you mentioned, for example, the sightings, those are the exact sightings that FRPR needs. So if you are putting those into your cost analysis, wouldn't it make sense to see what the cost analysis for FRPR is for those sightings and share that cost? Sure. Um, what, and I will say we're going to share as much information as we possibly can with Front Range, and we have been. Um, I, w I would, on the exact locations of the sightings, um, with our conversations with the CDOT team and the FRPR, I don't know that that is – the case that they're going to be at the exact same locations. It really depends on what the service is for Front Range Passenger Rail, when they're going to run during the time of day, when they leave in the mornings, et cetera, and where those meets, where we have to bypass. Um, and it, I think it depends on whether or not we're looking at an overlay service, are we looking at a true joint service, are we looking at a situation that's more express and then in, and in some local. Um, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily have the answer to at the moment. Um, so, so on that point, I don't know that we could say that the sightings are going to be in the exact same locations. Um, we have shared um, definitely the BNSF plans with the CDOT team and the Front Range Passenger Rail team. Um, on the determination, I, I don't believe that that determination has been made yet as to whether or not a um, an IGA or a um, like a joint authorities uh, a group above that is the way to go yet. Um, I know there's conversations happening really probably above the project level that I'm involved at um, to, to think about that. So I don't think that a determination has been made yet. Okay. Um, I personally am very interested in you forming that power authority so that you can all get in the same room and decide what, what you can share, where it's going to be instead of, as long as you're on the same rail lines, it makes sense that you sit down and discuss how you can both both the entities reduce costs sure. and share them, especially when you bring it back to us as a uh, as different jurisdictions to vote. And that's what I am very concerned about is the vote. So sure. um, the other thing you said there would be six new stations. Can you tell us what those are? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Downtown Westminster, which is near 88th, um, there's, uh, and then there's Broomfield uh, near 116th, Flatirons, um, Lewis, uh, downtown Louisville, Boulder Depot, at Ju uh, Boulder Junction at Depot Square, and Longmont. Oh, okay. Those were the same ones that have been identified yes. for quite a while. Yes, ma'am. Ma okay. Um, the other thing that I wanted to know, let me read these, my notes really fast. Um, as far as the operator, just as a, a thought process to, to you, wouldn't it make sense to have the same operator that FRPR has? Um, for example, if we choose Amtrak, but you choose another operator, both sharing BNSF lines, would it make sense to have the same operator, the same trains on there? so that when you are designing the cars, when you are designing the platforms, they would, if we're using the same platforms, then that discussion, I think, needs to be had during our SDP process. I agree 100% with you. In fact, we had a, a good conversation today with the Front Range Passenger Rail team, which is a, a follow-up of many that we've had. Um, 
that that does make a lot of sense to to look at that. I think it de- it really does depend. I think in a lot of ways about how the joint services kind of work. Um, one thing that's interesting, I think, with ours to note is that we our concept is securing peak period windows mm-hmm. for for peak service. Amtrak doesn't necessarily need that. Amtrak has a right to run on the train on the rail without securing those windows. That's sometimes easier said than done on corridors, and they they still have issues. I think working with the freight trains to make sure that they can run good schedules and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, Amtrak I think wouldn't necessarily be somebody that would probably work out very well for us as commuter rail by ourselves. Um, but if Front Range Passenger Rail had them on board, and we could have that discussion with Amtrak to possibly run both. I think those are those are good considerations to think about. Absolutely. So, um, and just for the board's um, information as well, the uh, BNSF and Union Pacific have had since the 60s. The BNSF has had the right to use the Union Pacific lines without going to Congress, um, and they. FRPR just signed an MOU with Wyoming who want the FRPR line to be extended. And with that, there are conversations that BNSF is having to move the freight off of the FRPR lines and reroute it through the east so that perhaps we won't have to share the lines with freight. So um, they are waiting for a higher authority, which FRPR district is to give them the okay to continue those conversations. We're in the process of convincing FRPR that they should give them permission to continue those conversations. But if that is something that might happen in the next 15 years or so, um, then that could help RTD as well with, with sharing lines. I just wanna put that on your radar because I'm working on that as hard as I can. More power to you on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Director Ward. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's always fun to have the pressure raised. <laughs> um, I just have a, a couple questions. Um, so one of the questions that I have is, um, as it relates to station design, you say you're going to use RCD standard commuter rail uh, platform. Height is not a not a concern I'm going to raise. What I'm asking about is the length of the platform. Are you using mm-hmm. your standard four car? Yeah, our, our, the RTD ones would be 400 feet is our standard. Um, what we've looked at are the two stations that we believe Front Range Passenger Rail is going to stop at. Is, and I, I think... They told me today, I think it's been approved by the board on those, but um, the stations that we believe Front Range Passenger Rail will also stop at and we, we, where we will share those facilities, um, we're looking at more like a 700 foot long platform for those locations. Thank you. Um, Making sure that we can accommodate a 700 yeah. foot long platform. I think the only issue I have with that, and that partially it goes to my issue Front Range Passenger Rail Board, is in the future, if additional stops on Front Range Passenger Rail are to be added, you're kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face right now um, by not having the existing capacity for longer trains in the future, and even longer trains of RTD's own should RTD operate. What we did, uh, you know, what I would, we haven't gotten into that necessarily level of detail for this study um, or level of design base is conceptual, but what we've done on the A line and the G line as an example is that we design our track geometry such that we can expand the platforms, which is something that we've done on our light rail systems as well. Um, We have looked at all the station locations and we believe they are extendable um, to probably double the 400 foot length um, if need be in the, in the future. Okay. Um, my next question is, you mentioned uh, you did your public engagement stuff and you took comments and questions and whatnot. Um, based on the two sessions you've had so far, 
how have you incorporated those comments? Because I don't see them. Well, you know, the, the reality is that this project, and it's, it's interesting on that regard, is that we, when the board authorizes us to take a look at it, um, stations were identified, the alignments identified, uh, the operating hours are identified. Um, so that was, our, that was our task, was to look at those potential pieces. So the comments that, uh, that we see here, these, these expansion things, that's the milestone four of our report is going to talk about you know, peak service is this. Um, what we've asked to look at is the peak service, and then what would it potentially take at probably a somewhat higher level to do some of these other things that we've heard from the community. So what would it take to do a reverse commute? Uh, what would it take to do a midday run? Uh, you know, what would it take to do weekend service? So those, we look at a lot of that public input is not necessarily something that influences a lot of the, because we're not going to change the alignment. It's on the BNSF tracks. Um, the, the station locations were actually not necessarily RTD generated. Those station locations are what we heard from the stakeholders. So there, there wasn't a whole lot, whole lot there. There are specifics to each station where we did hear from folks, but, you know, as far as locating where those are, as an example, it's not something that was, was likely to change. Um, so we've taken the input that we got really as far as what the service parameters are and, you know, thought about when we do next steps, if we, when we expand service some point in the future, because we know that peak service is, is not really meant to be our end service, um, you know, hopefully we can expand that service in the future. And then what we've heard from folks, what's important, what would be next? And that's what the milestone for and that feedback goes to. I thank you for that answer. Um, I think what RTD fails to recognize is you have a lot of irritated residents, uh, and I'll say that nicely. I would, I would um, say that I, we don't fail to recognize that. Well, I think you do because you haven't incorporated any of these concerns. You haven't incorporated, like, why on earth are we not doing a reverse commute, but we're going to build a layover platform for three trains in Westminster when you already are building a facility in Longmont for maintenance that you can just send right up there? Why are you going to be incorporating expanded bus connectivity service at these stations, recognizing that that was one of the major issues identified by residents? We are looking at that service plan for those. That is going to be part of the discussion for the bus services. I don't think so. we, we've engaged with our service planning answer. group um, to to look at that. So uh, that is part of that is part of it. Um, I understand what you're saying, but I don't. I don't think the residents are going to view it that way. And I think they view this really as slow walking the full implementation of North, Northwest Rail Line, which was promised to be roughly 55 trains a day when it was full voters. Sure. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Ward. Director Wheelock and then Director Baca. Yeah, can you, yeah, I just want to make sure you could get me here. Um, I, I have one question and then a couple of comments. Um, you mentioned that you had m met with just today, I think, with Front Range Passenger Rail in the last day or so. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we have a pretty regular meeting that we have with them, and one one just happened to be today. Yeah. And is it is it possible that a lot of the material you're presenting is based on and on behalf of work being done by not only Northwest Rail and RTD, but Front Range Passenger Rail as well? What I would say is that what we've tried to do is make sure that those conversations we've had with them, like I said, not precluding, we want to make sure that we don't design in such a way that going to be problematic and understanding what where they're going with their um, with their uh, service development plan is good for us to know so that we can you know you can't make sure that you're not precluding something if you don't know what it is somebody's trying to do um, so we're in different stages I would say of of discovery um, you know as I mentioned earlier the the the, uh, uh, the peak service is pretty well defined at the beginning um, we have a pretty good feel for what that peak service is, and uh, I think Front Range Passenger Rail is still working on their service development plan. 
So um, as best we can, yes, it does, it does try to reflect and accommodate a future front range passenger rail okay. service. Okay, My, so the comments I would like to make are these. Um, first of all, I'd like to echo both Mayor Peck and, and Councilman Ward's concerns about both the spirit of uh, collaboration as well as the need for systemic integration of systems in order to achieve statewide mobility systems, which is what was envisioned at, uh, uh, previously for front range passenger rail, which is chartered to run from at least um, Pueblo to Fort Collins. Uh, there were multiple routes that were considered uh, in the interest of fair play because uh, the Northwest Rail Line has been on the books and been and people have been paying into RTD for a long time for the purpose of getting that built. Um, the Front Range Passenger Rail in a spirit of co collaboration agreed um, that the routing should go th along the Northwest Rail Line as part of the Front Range Passenger Rail system achieving statewide mobility. Um, and that's a lot of the history of the routing. In the meantime, because of cost and political you know, challenges, the whole southern half of it's been truncated off as a phase two that won't be built then for a long time while this gets built. And so when we talk about integration of systems, it's a real serious, it's a real serious question. Uh, it's, uh, I don't even think it's intelligent at all to not to consider yourself in a silo and talk about potential partnerships with a front range passenger rail system that has already chosen this as part of its route to increase leverage to make this happen finally, which you deserve. Um, but to consider yourself independent of that is something that is problematic in messaging. And so my advice is on the side of messaging and also on the side of strategy and collaboration to be thinking about it as a systemic thing that's gonna help the entire state. And uh, I know Andy Carson is planning, planning to present here from Front Range Passenger Rail in August, and, he might, and he's part of all of those negotiations, and I think that um, uh, he'll be able to help inform the board here uh, in August uh, to a greater degree about that collaboration and uh, systemic integration. And, and know Andy well. We've talked to him many times. Thanks for the comment. And, and when I say kind of on our own, um, I, I, I do want to kind of clarify that a little bit, that basically – the board has asked us to take a look at it. We, we as RTD needed needed to understand too. If if front range passenger rail didn't didn't come about as an example, what is it? We still want to understand from RTD's perspective how we might do it and what those impacts might potentially be. Mm -hmm. um, so that is an important piece for us to know as a foundational piece of information. We want to be able to take all that and bring those into those discussions with the front range passenger rail. What we've learned um, so far. And just so you know, like, um, I don't know if it's philosophical, but strategically, I think of Northwest Rail as part of Front Range Passenger Rail, even though they're independent political and economic entities at this time. That's how that's what's leveraged this to help make it move forward at a, at a, at a faster pace. I'm also on the board of directors of Front Range sure. Passenger Rail District. Thanks. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Director Baca. Thank you, Chair. Um, not to duplicate what's already been talked about this evening, I really appreciate the conversation and thank you for your presentation. So Adams County does, <clears throat> we barely touch the Northwest Rail and we put a lot of that on the city of Westminster. Um, the stop itself will be in the city of Westminster city limits. So my concern tonight is that um, Front Range Passenger Rail has met individually with each of the county commissioners, also our staff, and they are not messaging that there's a collaboration here between RTD, the Northwest Rail, that you're on the same rail line, um, that there's no partnership. They don't mention you at all, um, okay. which is really concerning to me because we are part of the taxing district of Front Range Passenger Rail. They are very tax district forward of do you support the tax and what do we need you to get to yes? Those are my words, not theirs. Um, and I just am really concerned this evening that is it advantageous for the citizens of Adams County? They're already very hot that um, our end line is not complete and it has not been built to its completion. Um, do we need to be part of this taxing district if this is already something covered by RTD? So I guess I'm an alternate this evening. I'm not understanding the collaboration and partnership. It's very concerning because I will need to message somehow 
to the residents of Adams County that this is a good idea that we stay in the taxing district. And I think it's really um, concerning that Front Range Passenger Rail does not recognize you at all. It has not mentioned Northwest, has not mentioned RTD, has not mentioned the shared line that you'll be on. And what work you're doing, what work they're doing, how this looks um, for the bigger picture, other than we all have a boss and the governor wants this done. Sure. Um, well, and I, I, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say I, I can't necessarily speak for the Front Range Passenger Rail. I wasn't at, at those, and I'm not sure what was there. What I can say from my experience, and we've done many joint presentations actually with Andy Karzian, um, and I, I would, from my perspective, I have seen that. Um, expressed by them um but it, again I, I haven't been at those particular meetings um so i guess my experience is a little bit different and, and like i said all of our discussions are um talked about in in some of that light so uh, i i don't it looks like I, I don't know exactly what 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 they're saying but um in my experience it has been a more collaborative conversation in general but um and I do think their their approach, um, if you're not hearing it, I, I don't know that that's necessarily reflective of the conversations that we've had with them and the, the discussion and the negotiations and coordination that we've done. If that makes any sense. I, I think what, what we're seeing on our side is a little bit more, is definitely a more cooperative um, uh, environment than, than maybe what you're hearing. Director Peck. So I uh, agree uh, in part with both what Director Relock and um, the last director stated. That is why I would like you to take back to RTD the urgency of a uh, power, of a joint power authority, where everyone sits down in the room and works this out together with the funding that the uh, governor has put forward in the next couple of years with the funding FRA is getting, with the funding that uh, RTD could get from FTA, and how can you make this work? It has to be a team effort. So um, we don't have a lot of time, according to the governor, and it is his rail line. So um, I would like you to please take that back to RTD, the urgency of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Cole, for introduction. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Sorry, I went kind of long there. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> All right, have a good, good discussion. Um, okay, so I'm online and I did. I had my hand oh, raised. This is Director Nermella. Nermella. Yeah. Director Nermella. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, also share in um, some of the or express, share in expressing some of the desire um, to have, uh, you know, from, I represent city of Westminster and I'm also on the front range passenger rail board. Um, you know, like many of the directors have expressed, we've had a <laughs> frustration from our community that, uh, you know, we haven't had this rail service. We've been paying on it for a long time and we'd really like to see more interaction with RTD. Um, I feel like the Front Range Passenger Rail Board has been um, working to speak directly with the uh, communities in the Northwest area. And um, I don't feel like RTD is as accessible and, um, and, and really demonstrating that they're listening to uh, the cities that are going to be hosting the, you know, theoretically this rail service. Um, I also want to say that the, the directionality, you know, as, as director Ward mentioned, you know, it's, it's the, the three trains in the morning and in the evening in, in the opposite direction um, are based on a, a ridership. I don't know if there was an actual ridership analysis done, um, but I'm. it was, I believe, done before COVID. And so just, again, trying to at least have, you know, a lot of us are data people. <laughs> we wanna see the ridership um, provide a basis for future expansion of this and, and future funding. Um, that's what this pilot service is for. Um, and 
So we just want to make sure that we are going in the right direction. And I'd really love to see, you know, two directions <laughs> offered with the service. And so I just want to emphasize that working with front range passenger rail to provide some interoperability is really, I, I think the right way to go here. I mean, the being able to share in the costs, but also share in the convenience. You can see from the community input that the other direction is desired and you know, potentially greater frequency um, weekend service. Those are things that we were hoping to have 55 trains of, but you know, the at minimum, if we could just have you know, two directions would be would be great. Um, and I also do want to emphasize that a lot of us are um, looking at what are the you know the station platform length. I think that Director Ward provides a good uh, or had a good question there um, in terms of identifying opportunities for secondary stations for the front range passenger rail, and maybe it wouldn't be so difficult if we actually had a service that might have an express portion um, versus, uh, you know, um, additional stops for certain lines and to be looking at that versus, um, I don't know what the, you know, what the solution would be that otherwise, but kind of hoping that we would have some a service that would be more integrated and offer our community better options so thanks thank you all right we are a little over time so i'd like to go ahead and move on to our committee reports if possible but thank you patrick we appreciate it now these committee reports please be brief if you can um <laughs> Uh, the here, here. report from Stack, uh, Director Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, because we didn't meet last month as a as Dr. Cog, I'll, I'll just tr quickly try to summarize the last two Stack meetings. Uh, so we dis in June we discussed the multimodal um, options fund distributed distribution changes to match relief, and because Dr. Cog has already allocated the multimodal options fund through fiscal year 27. These changes don't affect any jurisdictions in the Denver region. And also discussed was that uh, Senate Bill 24-032, which is the ozone season and youth free fare program that provides grants to transit authorities used to or uses a portion of state share as the funding source. So because recipients or receipts outpace um, initial estimates, there are no reductions to the funding that Dr. Cog has already allocated. So however, it does reduce the amount we can actually, or that we actually would have received by about $5.8 million. And in the July meeting, real quick, CDOT provided updates on, on the process for developing the next statewide transportation plan, active transportation plan, and strategic highway safety plan. And these are all processes that Dr. Cog will be engaging in and opportunities for local agency participation for the next 18 months or so. And then Stack was also informed that the Transportation Commission decided to retain the current regional priority program funding distribution formula rather than the Stack recommended formula, that which is what Dr. Cog opposed. And that would have been a disadvantage for region one, which re represent most of our region. And that's it. Thank you very much. Report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, full caucus met on June the 5th. We had a, uh, a report from our new executive director about a couple of new programs that are coming, the Mayor's Leadership Academy, a future housing coalition. We had a, a, a uh, informational report back on website updates, and rebranding uh, of, the, of the organization. We had Danny Katz with Coperg coming in to talk about transportation and mobility. 
We had, um, let's see, a discussion from RTD. It looked like they're debrucing efforts, a discussion with uh, Jen Webster and uh, Deborah. And then we had, uh, let's see, Bev Staples with uh, CML come in to talk about the uh, legislative results uh, and some of the things that were going on in that thing. And then we had in the second half of our meeting an internal uh, discussions with the group. With that, I will conclude my report. Thank you very much. We don't have um, Director Teal here, but I believe Metro Area County Commissioners are meeting on Friday here in this room. Um, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla. Hello, for those of you who are new, I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren. I'm the Director of the Area Agency on Aging here at Dr. Cox. We had our Advisory Committee on Aging meeting at the Volunteers of America. Um, Central Kitchen site, which is in Commerce City, it's relatively new. You know, we've um, Volunteers of America has been in existence for 128 years. We've been partnering with them for 48 <coughs> years um, to provide food and nutrition. Um, we contract um, with them to provide home delivered meals, congregate meals. Um, they have a registered dietitian service that we utilize. Transportation in Gilpin and Clear Creek County is provided by. Volunteers of America. They do a healthy age to, it's a fall prevention program called Healthy Age to, Healthy Moves to Age Well. Um, and then uh, we also contract with them to do a handyman service. We had a lunch, we toured the kitchen and learned about all the process to prepare, frat, flash, flash freeze the, the meals, right? get them uh, packaged up for the volunteers, the hundreds of volunteers that take them out to uh, folks every single day. About 4,000 meals a day goes out um, from Volunteers of America. And um, I know uh, we had uh, two, Director Conklin and Director Hazeman also went um, out on that. I don't know if you want to say anything. It was awesome. And it, no, it, 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 it was very impressive, and it was great getting that group together in that setting. Uh, the the uh, ACA is, is trying to meet in person what every other meeting, uh -huh. uh, and, and that tour was just fantastic. We're hoping to go to Broomfield next, Broomfield um, Recreation Center, where we also fund a number of programs. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you. No report from RAC. Uh, report from the E-470 Authority, Director Diet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a public affairs uh, mid-year update. Uh, it's fair and special events season in all the voting member communities. We got an update on that. We also had an update on uh, roadshow schedule, which is um, uh, E-470 staff going out to both voting and non-voting jurisdictions or whoever wants them to, to attend. Uh, we also got um, uh, crash report updates from risk management and uh, Colorado State Patrol. Uh, crash reports are, are down, but they are up within the corridor that we're widening, which is I-70 to 104th. Also on the, um, June 28th, I believe, I was happy to attend a uh, interchange ground or um, uh, ribbon cutting. Um, that is the um, that is the E-470 uh, interchange that that will uh, service Aurora Highlands um, as as growth occurs uh, in Arapaho and Adams County. Um, we will continue to. Um, uh, do organic interchanges as well as modif how to modify existing ones. Um, happy to, to be a part of that. Uh, we had Director Baca uh, there as well. Uh, had a, a host of people from uh, Aurora as well as Adams County. That is all. Thank you very much. Uh, no report from CDOT tonight. Uh, Regional Transportation District. Bye, Brian. What you've all been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you know we've been celebrating the 50 millionth passenger on the A-Line. On Saturday, we are partnering with a number of other organizations to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which, as you know, is part and parcel of what we do in transportation. And then finally, we are making good progress on our downtown rail replacement project. Fantastic cooperation from the city and county of Denver. We're actually ahead of schedule. That's my report. Thank you very much. Um, our next meeting is August 21st. Are there any other um, announcements or comments? Director Rex. 
Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. This is primarily for the new members in the room. So if you parked in the parking garage, um, we have uh, Melinda has parking validation for you. Also, please use this door here. If you go outside, you can't get back into the building. So use this door. Follow everybody else out this door. <laughs> don't, don't go up. Those thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned.